Why? Hello and welcome everybody. So today I wanted to go ahead and talk to you guys about the uh, atlas I'm going to be doing for 3.23. Now, normally I have a very vanilla style atlas that I typically progress each league, but as I've kind of wanted to go a little bit quicker and quicker, I'm going to be molding my atlas around that. If you guys are familiar with how some of the racers do their progression, it is going to be a very similar setup. Uh, so let's talk about it. So one of the first things I want to do and I just want to state that I've tried this in SSF and I really like it. So I'm going to be aiming more towards this. I think it is extremely similar to Jungron, uh, how he is doing his Atlas, at least at the beginning, the first like 40 points. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're not going into league mechanics, right? League mechanics come on a little bit later. It doesn't mean we won't do them during our progression. It just means it's not the focus, right? Typically, you want to build up your map base. You want to um, you know, start unlocking your Atlas, start getting all the juicy points, at least get into your yellow maps, then you kind of want to lean a little bit heavier into them. So the, the bare bone basics is basically going to be getting our two void stones so that we can buff up all of our map tiers, get bonus map drops, and then kind of pursue from there. So we're going to go in a straight line directly up into the Kirak wheel. Now the reasoning for the Kirak wheel here is we want to start building up our Kirak maps, and what's going to happen is we're going to end up using Kirak to help filling out the the void of map drops, which I will explain in a minute. So first thing we're going to do is just swing directly up here into Wandering Path. Now, the purpose of Wandering Path is it's going to double all of the notes, like the little baby notes here, but it makes these useless. The purpose of this is it doubles all of the Kirak nodes to 2%. So we're already at 6% or 8% chance at Kirak. And these nodes here, the adjacent map drop nodes are extremely strong because they essentially guarantee you progression. It's just not always in a straight line, right? So next step would be filling out the adjacent map pool and targeting Kirak. So this here sets us at 14% chance at Kirak. And then the next one I wanna do is come over here and you can see now we're at 48% chance at the map bonus, right? Over here, I will typically grab these Jun missions. The purpose of the Jun missions, if you guys have ever played Righteous Fire, uh, I love targeting the crafts. So really quick, I will just pull up a little document. There's going to be a really quick flashbang here. When I play SSF, I typically uh, have this little goal sheet that I follow, and there's a list of betrayal unveils. So there, here's an example of some things you can unveil right away. 6% physical damage taken as fire and lightning, plus one area of effect gems on your gloves and helmet. Actually, it can even be plus two when it's unveiled. That's the craft. 3% flask regen. Uh, unveil hybrid chaos, so that's the fire and lightning, um, sorry, fire and chaos, lightning and chaos, cold and chaos, fire multi on your weapon, uh, fire damage and ignite chance on your weapon, minimum frenzy, uh, increased damage on your rings, damage during flask effect, physical taken as fire, a lot of very good mods for our build and in general for builds. So I'm a huge fan of Jun, so I like to try to pick this. I don't typically run the Jun missions yet, um, if I do run them, I will make sure they're in the highest tier. So if it's in a white map, it'll be tier five. If it's in a yellow, it'll be like a tier 10. I don't know if that really affects it much, but that's just kind of what I do. Typically, I will save this till I drop Wandering Path, or if I'm keeping Wandering Path, I will try to allocate these extra nodes before. But that's not the focus right now, right? This is just very, very efficient. So from here, what I like to do is now focus on getting this number to 100%. So what we're going to go ahead and do is kind of just start peeking these nodes, right? And just aiming towards 100. Now, what is a what a good thing is to do is kind of aim where you want to go next. So I will explain here in a second what we are doing next. What's nice is you also have the option of taking the extra map nodes, although I don't think you necessarily need them right away. This is definitely something I will pick up a bit later. So now that I have this foundation completed, I want to explain where the currency will start coming in from, because this is good and all. This helps you get into the T16 maps, right? But you're not making any currency yet unless you get lucky drops. So over here, I have a uh, basically this was like my template Alice. It's the exact same thing that we just did, right? So that's good to know that that's exactly in sync. So then over here, we have the Atlas at a bit more points. And to explain where my money making strategy comes from, it is Expedition. Now, you can take out Expedition and choose to replace it with Harvest. Harvest is not really very good at the beginning game because typically Harvest kind of ramps, excuse me, in its currency generation because once people have their base items and everything else, then they start buying the Harvest juice to my knowledge and start crafting their gear. Expedition is the opposite. 
Expedition is, I have no currency, let me go run Expedition, generate raw wealth, then use that wealth on other things. So again, the purpose of Expedition is the following. You encounter an Expedition node, or like, like uh, in your map, right? You walk to the middle of the Expedition, you place down the bomb, you hover over the little Expedition thing, if it says uh, immunity to fire, you move the bomb, if it's unmovable, just skip it, it's fine. If it says overwhelm physical damage reduction, you will die, but you can clear it. If it says 100% of physical damage is extra chaos, you will die, but you can clear it. If it says mobs crit you every single time and you stand still, unfortunately, you will die, but you can clear it. So anyway, those are some of the ones that you want to pay attention to, right? Things can be mitigated. If, you, for example, you are in a block-based setup with Inquisitor and you have phasing, phasing is key for this, uh, you can kind of just like phase through and you don't really have to worry too much, right? So I'm going to go ahead and show an example. It's a little bit exaggerated of an example here. Uh, oh, actually, this is not the right one. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. This is a little bit of an exaggerated example, but this is also how I do my expeditions. So I will spawn all of the monsters. And then once all of the monsters here are spawned, what I will do is I will get um, call to arms on the tree. So I typically deviate a few points in my POB. So I know I didn't cover the POB here, but it's just really easy. You just go like this, right? You take your call to arms. And then once you spawn, you insta war cry and you try to kill like one monster. And once you kill one monster, if you have enough AOE, it will look very similar to what you are about to see here. Not the exact same, but it will be similar. Now this is an explode build. So it takes that to the next level times like 14. But this is still an opportunity to uh, essentially kill a bunch of monsters, get a bunch of loot in the very early game. And this is how I generate my wealth. Now, when you're doing this, you'll see there's a whole bunch of loot that drops. You make money off of a bunch of gumball like stack decks. Uh, you start getting these uh, currency. So one of the biggest ones are Black Scythe mercenary currency. The Black Scythe currency is with Tulian. And Tulian is quite literally like a little money printer. You go to him and you gamble. So you can buy out the chaos. If you get really lucky, you get the vines. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Scours, regrets, Cheula splinters, who you name it. He's got everything in there. Then you've got um, three other people that can spawn with Expedition, right? You also have um, Rog. Rog is fantastic for gear crafting. Also for people who don't know how to craft in PoE, you can just mess around with Rog because you're not really losing anything. You're just losing the Rog currency, which I mean, you can't sell it outside of the, the one specific thing. So you don't really have to worry there. And then there's Danning. Danning basically allows you to convert currency to any of the others. And then there's um, Gwen. Gwen allows you to basically gamble reroll. Unlikely you get something good, but hey, just some more fun. Um, so that's pretty much how this works. The last thing I will pretty much state is shadow shaping. Unfortunately, I don't have a great example here for shadow shaping. Uh, I'm about to do the most scuffed MS paint thing you've ever seen in your entire life. So let's go ahead and do it really fast here. I don't know why I'm doing it like this. This is what League Start does to you. All right. So say this here is in a toll map and say your atoll map is connected to a map here, a map here and a map here, right? So you have your, I know, just, just accept it right here. I know, man. So say this is kind of like how your atoll map is, right? It's connected like this. Well, what shadow shaping does is it says maps found cannot be your favorite. Maps found in your maps have a chance to have a special implicit. So now let's take this one step further and say this map here is also connected to a map right here. Oop, why is that one in red or orange? A map here and a map right here, right? So... Here's what happens now. This is why shadow shaping is cool. So what you can do is shadow shaping. Say you really like these two maps right here. Maybe this is a toll and this is Mesa. So what you can do is you can say, uh, let's see here. How do we do this? We can say, uh, I favorite this map. I favorite this map. I favorite this map and I favorite this map. So that would require four favorite slots, which is not too bad. You know, a little bit later into the game, you'll easily get four favorite slots. And what shadow shaping does now is it says maps found cannot be your favorite. So you cannot find these four maps by normal fashion. So when you are mapping and you have a 100% adjacent map drop and a map drops, guess what? It's going to be this one or this one like 99% of the time. 
and then you can kind of ping pong your maps back and forth. This is very good for creating your own form of self-sustain. And then you can pick your two maps specifically you want to do for the league mechanic. So, or not league, well, any, any mechanic you're really doing, right? So this is a nice strategy that I like to do. Um, very comfy, very cozy. So this is kind of what I'm going to be aiming towards. I don't know what maps I'm going to be doing yet. But anyway, that's pretty much a, a rough example of what I'm doing. Um, you'll notice that in this Atlas as well, I started dropping Kirak missions. That's primarily because I will keep the Kirak missions uh, until I fill out my Atlas. And then as my Atlas is getting pretty filled up, I will sort of pull away from Kirak and not really focus on it much anymore. Anyway, hope that helped you guys out. If it did, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget, you can catch me streaming live every day at twitch.tv box. Thanks so much, and I'll see you guys all tomorrow.